Доброе утро. Большое спасибо, что вы пришли. Late, so uh, I very much appreciate you uh, showing up. Um, first, a little about me, and then I'm going to ask about you. Um, let's see. I work at ICANN. My name is Richard Lamb. Uh, please do not call me doctor. Uh, and um, so I, I've uh, had a couple startups before. Well, I went to, you know, I've always been an engineer. Uh, I've always been a geek, always working on uh, electronics from childhood. Then I went to uh, MIT, which is a, a small school inside, at Boston in the U.S., got my doctorate there. And then I did a number of startups, um, sold one to Microsoft. Um, they're all networking startups, so I, this crowd very much is of interest to me. Uh, network address translation was one of the first ones. Um, and then after that, for a short time, after doing a number of other startups, being lucky, uh, I worked uh, in the U.S. Foreign Affairs Office for a short time just to uh, see what bureaucracy is like, and, and I lost almost all of my hair because this was one of the hardest jobs I, I've ever, ever had. So I have actually a very lar large respect for, for bureaucrats because sometimes their jobs are not so easy. Um, okay, so before I go on on this, I'm looking at the audience. I want to know, raise your hand if you know what DNS is. Okay. Raise your hand if you know what DNSSEC is. Okay. And this is the last question. How many of you actually manage DNS or DNS system? Okay, good. All right. This, this I was going to use to determine how, um, how much in detail or how little in detail I would go into. And, of course, the resolver then remembers this response and sends this to everybody. And, of course, this is a problem. We type login page, we type in our password, and we have problems. You guys all know this. Why else am I excited about this? Well, there have been a number of examples where um, such, a, a, such attacks happened and we could benefit from something like DNSSEC that would ensure that these kind of attacks would not would be avoided. DNS changer was one of them. Uh, I know these are just kind of marketing slides. I'm not a marketing person. I really am an engineer. I code and see, <laughs> okay? But sometimes it's, it's useful to have these slides. These slides are all free. You could do whatever you want to with them. Um, so, of course, you know, you have your, your normal, you know, website. So, you, you know, you, you got your normal website uh, like this. Um, but with DNSSEC, you get some additional protections. And this is, this is a good thing. So. Again, feel free to take any of these slides and use them yourself. You do not even have to give me any credit. I don't care. Um, all right, so, uh, you know, so the other things that have happened, of course, here's this, a list of various DNS hijacks that have happened. These are things just try to motivate, you know, DNSSEC. All right, uh, business case, big change. Everyone knows DNSSEC is the biggest change in 20 years. Um, there's been a fairly good deployment of it, but, you know, not perfect. A number of governments have actually um, mandated is too strong a word, but have encouraged deployment of DNSSEC, particularly in some of their financial institutions. You saw a bank in Costa Rica there. They're actually pushing DNSSEC for banks. Brazil uh, does this. Anyway, some more, more things uh, that where DNSSEC could help. Uh, we actually had a study in the U.S. by our uh, communications ministry, and it came back and said uh, Americans are, well, Americans are not known for very, being very intelligent. So we tend to click on things and, <laughs> and get redirected to so many different things, and DNSSEC might help here. Uh, the U.S. government has a mandate to deploy DNSSEC within the government. Good pictures. DNSSEC is happening. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I'm very happy that Armenia was one of the very early deployers of DNSSEC, at least the cctld.am had DNSSEC deployed in February 2011. Woohoo! Great, all right? Um, currently, 1,300, over 1,500 TLDs have DNSSEC deployed. That's countries, new TLDs, et cetera. Of course, it's required for all new GTLDs, so that's, that's going to be there for that. Uh, root signed, again. A lot of good things, um, you know, some hosting providers have 
made it uh, deployed by default. Google has uh, it running on one of their resolvers that uh, about 25% of the world uses. Um, so it's really, really very good. Um, that's, I don't want to waste time, but that's a funny story. It's, it's just three guys in Google, uh, if you meet them. And they just decided one day, yeah, why don't we just put the NSSEC in there? But I'm very happy for that. Uh, but at, as far as this being useful, we're kind of limited. Only 3% only of domain names, like Google.com, is not the NSSEC signed. Okay? Uh, so only 3% of those names have DNSSEC. So we still have a problem. Why? All right. So what's the problem? This is what people tell me. We're busy. We have other, prob other things going on in the IT department for big companies. There are other things we need to do. So let's not worry about this. The other thing is certain um, load sharing content distribution networks uh, use tricks in the DNS to perform their functions. Nothing wrong with it, but breaks DNSSEC. Uh, so if it's not successful and it's not deployed everywhere and we're only at 3%, why do we care in this room? Okay? Most of us would say, ah, forget it, right? 3%, I'll wait till it gets to be a bigger deal. Well, there are multiple reasons, okay? It's being deployed at a pretty solid rate at the infrastructure, so it's something that will eventually be deployed. But from my perspective, I told you that I'm a startup guy. I smell opportunity, all right? When something is not popular, not everywhere, but there's this kind of undercurrent of growth, this is the time to actually think of ways to use DNSSEC. And what I would do is uh, file patents on new ideas, you know, and, and make some money, you know? So uh, anyway, uh, and this was something that Vint Cerf, you know, our father of the internet, you know, also noticed when we um, signed the root in 2010, we generated a key, um, big, big ceremony, whatever. Vince Cerf said, yeah, more has happened today than we think, All right? Because for people like me and other engineers, DNSSEC is not just about signing and, and protecting DNS. It's about all these other functions that we can do with DNSSEC. Now we have a secure global method database to distribute information. This is why techies like me are happy about this, not just because it protects the DNS. Um, you can read that. Many, many different things that it can be applied to. Um, yeah, good line. Okay. So, now to the part of my talk, why you were here. This is a, op, uh, this is a group of op network operators. You want to know, okay, how do I make this stuff work? How do I do it correctly? So now we switch into the techie part of the talk. How do I sign a zone? So you have DNS already. Most of you understand DNS or actually are DNS operators. How do you sign a zone? Well, this is the only difference between DNS and DNSSEC. Many of you know this. You have the record. And then with DNSSEC, you have a signature, additional cryptographic information. This is typically what we see CCTLDs and many TLDs do. It's called bump in the wire. All you do is you preserve your existing infrastructure and you add a box in between and you slowly roll this out. Okay, you don't just turn it on on day one, slowly roll, roll it out. The other way to do this, and I get this all the time, DNSSEC like is too complicated. I don't want to do it. Let someone else do it. <laughs> okay, that's fine. You know, this is a perfectly reasonable, I would like to see everyone do this themselves because I think you learn something by going through this exercise. But Maybe you don't have the resources. This is fine. Use a third party. Um, but how you do it is all really a matter of risk and trust. Um, you know, yesterday there was a wonderful risk analysis um, presentation by Alex Smirnoff, and uh, you know, he was dead on on many of his points. This is not that hard. It's just a matter of, of following a certain process. So what are the goals of, of a of an implementation, a, DNS, a good DNSSEC implementation, it's got to work. People got to trust it because now you have keys. Now you have keys. So, you know, this is something now that a bank might trust, not just engineers, but some on the outside, not geeks. All right? uh, and it, that it doesn't cost too much money. I mean, so 
These are all things that I'm sure you, you guys realize, yet I see over and over again when, when implement DNSSEC implementations where they've made it too complicated. You want to keep this as simple as possible. And the other lesson learned is monitoring. You know, now we have time. So, and, so the signatures can expire, things can fail. So this is very important that we actually have the, the, the concept of time um, being monitored. And it doesn't matter how many times I say this, hopefully there's no one here from Kazakhstan, but every year on December 31st, Kazakhstan's signatures expire. Why would you make a signature expire on the 31st? That's New Year's Eve. No one's going to be around. Make it expire in February. Anyway, common sense things, right? Okay, but every year. Same with, same with Myanmar. I don't, I don't see anybody from there. So anyway, so there's people, um, so checklists and documentations. We hate this kind of thing, but th these are the things we really need to make DNSSEC work. And at this point, you might say, this is too hard. I don't want to do DNSSEC. That's fine. Don't do this unless you're ready. <laughs> if you're not ready to take on this stuff, it's better not to deploy DNSSEC. My employer will fire me for pushing, saying that too much, but it's true, right? If you're not ready, this can cause you more problems. All right, cost effectiveness. Risk assessments, these, these are terms that at least uh, myself as an engineer, except for you know, Alex yesterday, his presentation, he understands this world very well, but most of us engineers go, ah, risk assessments, this is lawyer stuff. All right. But it's really not that hard. You know? Um, yeah, skip that slide. Okay. What are your risks? Is it your reputation? Is it something to, uh, uh, to work with your competition? You want to make sure you have uh, an implementation that is better than the others and it does not fail. Could be that. Could be a contract. If you're doing something for, say, a government agency or something, you're required to maintain things and you lose the contract, legal, financial, lawsuits, things like this, these actually can all be handled very well with one document. And I'm going to give you that document. And you can download this document. And you can, uh, uh, unfortunately, some countries, some CCTLDs, simply copy the document, which was originally in Swedish, and replace the entries and put in their, um, I won't say who, but put in their, you know, their entry all through the document. And so it still has the Swedish translation errors in it. So, so don't do that, but, but, but this is what people do with DNSSEC now. So, all right. The biggest vulnerability here for DNSSEC that I see is false expectations. Um, this means you, you don't want the public or your users to think somehow, now that you have DNSSEC, I'm going to get no viruses, I'm going to get no malware, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly safe, I'm, I am cyber secure. That's bull, right? That's impossible. So just make sure you un they understand what it is you are providing them and what the limitations are. Again, this will be in the document that I will show here. It's called a DPS. Other thing is key compromise. Turns out key compromise is very rare. We had a professional uh, risk analysis firm um, do all this analysis for us for the, for the root because, of course, we had to. And we're talking 0.1 percent, you know, probably the key compromise. It still can happen. And you still must protect against it. But it's, it's much lower. Uh, more likely to happen is the data. You have this, you know, your existing infrastructure, DNS infrastructure. You can build the, the biggest security you can with the, you know, the fanciest keys and armed guards, but if you don't protect the information that you're trying to protect, it's garbage in, garbage out, which is what a lot of times people say. You're not protecting anything. You're not, you're not gaining anything. So, you know, really it's not so much about keys. Doesn't have to be expensive. Um, this is a little bit old, but ANISA is a European uh, Union advised, technical advisory organization. It's a little old, but the main thing to point out here is their conclusion is learn from others. Don't spend this money up front. It doesn't cost this much. Learn, learn from the mistakes that others have made, and there have been many mistakes. So, uh, yeah, don't care. All right. Um, also, a little bit old, but people always ask, okay, what is this going to cost me? 
this is from the Swedish Banking Association a few years back, many years back, but they said half a full-time employee. That's clearly not the case once everything is running, but their estimate was about an additional half a full-time employee to make this happen. The rest of this crypto information bandwidth, relatively minor things here. All right, how do you make it trusted? Just be honest. One of the hardest things for me to, to, to explain to some of my engineering colleagues, it's not that people don't trust you. Of course they trust you individually, but they need to trust the way the process works, the overall process. And, and it's people that don't know you. How do you get them to trust you? So when I, I point to them, I say, well, you have to be honest. Well, of course I'm honest. And they get all angry at me. They go, well, no, 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 it's not personal, right? You have to have a, you have to have a system or a process that, that makes it clear who is involved with things? This is, this is like business school stuff. Uh, transparency, all right. The power of the truth. See, I learned all this the hard way because I'm an engineer. I, didn't, I don't think this way, <laughs> okay? I build stuff, make it work. But I learned through this process that just simply tell people what you're doing. Say what you're gonna do, do it, and then prove it somehow. Logs, whatever, log files, pictures, Okay, so how do you say what you do? Set your, setting expectations again. If the key gets compromised, we will recover in two weeks. You don't have to say you'll recover right away, and you certainly don't want to say that you'll never be compromised. Just say, if, when, if the key gets compromised, here is the expect, expected path, time, that will take us to recover. Uh, Got to maintain up-to-date documentation. And again, it's not about you know, personal roles. It's about the overall system. Let's see how we're doing time. All right. I'll do I promise to leave some time here. Okay. Um, so learn from other people's mistakes. Certificate authorities. How many people know what certificate authorities are? Good. Everyone knows what a certificate authority is. All right. All right. They're in the business of selling trust. Trust me. Right. This is, this is their business. Right. So instead of starting from scratch, just use what, what's already there. So these are good things. Of course, they've had problems too, as many of you know, I'm sure, particularly some of, some of the people from RIPE know, because this was, a, uh, um, I think, a study that uh, I've seen over and over again. But um, there's so many certificate authorities. And like anything else, where there's so many p points where that could be trusted, occasionally there's a mistake. It's not malicious, usually. It's just, you know, fat fingers, mistakes. But if you have too many, you have this. So these are some of the problems that DNSSEC can solve. All right. So what, is this, what does this certificate authority do? They publish something called a CPS. This is just a document, okay? Um, big document that says if there's a fire, here's the fire controls. Um, we have three people that we need every time we do any kind of key management activity. Um, our address is this. <laughs> You know, really basic stuff. So what do we do for, for DNSSEC? We do the same thing, literally, the DPS. It provides a level of insurance. It gets management involved in a small way, which is important. Uh, because as, as great as us engineers are, at some point there needs to be some sort of management connection to this thing. So for the root, we have hundreds, you know, hundreds of pages for this. You don't need to do that. You're certainly welcome to do that. Here's the Swedish document, 22 pages. Very nice of them. Great people. They were one of the very early adopters of DNSSEC, and, uh, and I'm, I'm sure there's some Swedish people here, but I say this with, with the most endearing, uh, uh, that, uh, endearing uh, words I could use. They're like, they're like stuck-up Germans, you know? No, but I, and I love them for this, because they they are so good in getting these details right, and, it, and, it's, and they're so certain and confident, you know, about how things are done. And for the root, we had a couple uh, Swedish uh, uh, people, gentlemen, they're still involved with some of, the, some of the efforts we do, would not have happened without them. Because, because of that attitude and because of that confidence and knowledge and ability, <clears throat> they're able to go into a conference like this, and if there are any questions, they just immediately say, no, you're wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> and they just move on. 
Can't do that as an American. Americans, we're like, yeah, wishy-washy. Oh, you know, we'll consider this. So anyway, enough about the Swedes. I love the Swedes. <laughs> so, uh, so we can use that document. Um, do what you say. So now you've published this document on your web page. Follow the document. Very simple, right? Maintain logs every time you execute a program. Um, some video, maybe some people involved in watching what you're doing. This is where the term key ceremony comes in. Has anyone heard of the term key ceremony in here? Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, we actually, yeah, we have people that are <laughs> very closely involved. But, um, so it sounds kind of strange, tea ceremony, key ceremony, you know, what, it, what is it? It's actually a term of art, okay? And it's used for any situation where key, there is key management. I've had people, after I've gone through this presentation or even gone through a demonstration, they've come up to me and said, that is exactly what we use in the Peruvian Navy for our key management. How do you know how we do this secretly? Said, well, there's only a fixed number of ways to do this. So there really is a standard approach to doing this. I was really amazed. We paid hundreds of thousands of dollars at ICANN to uh, KPMG and a bunch of accounting firms to learn this information. And it turns out everyone kind of does it this way, but they all keep it secret. We don't. We have to. We, that's why I'm here explaining this to you. I'm telling you all the secrets and opening the kimono. So, all right. Prove it. Say, say what you're going to do. Do it. Prove it. How do we prove this? Well, you could pay for an auditor, ISO 27,000, $100,000 a year, $40,000 a year. We do this because, you know, no one trusts ICANN. So, <laughs> sorry. So, so we, we need to build, we need, we need belt and suspenders. We need to do everything we possibly can. So we do a full audit. Um, but some simple internal audit, once a year, that's fine. It depends on who your customer is, who you're trying to convince. We're trying to, for DNSSEC, as I said earlier, we're not just trying to pr protect the DNS. We want to create a platform that financial institutions will trust, governments will trust, we will trust as end users. So we need to wear suits, even though we hate wearing suits, <laughs> to try to sell this thing, if you will to a, a wider audience. In fact, the first key ceremony, I actually, well, I'll get into it. I forced everyone to buy a suit. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so this audit material key is like just what happened in the room while we were generating keys. A key ceremony is where we sit there, we actually gener pull out maybe a laptop that's offline, generate keys on that, and just go through step by step by step by step with witnesses. And we do, we do this a lot. I'll get into this. Anyway, these are the type of things you could have. All right. How do you prove this? A key ceremony is an excellent opportunity to bring in some of the local internet community, your customers, maybe a government representative. They feel like they're doing something, and they see it. And then they become advocates for you. And this is exactly what, what worked out for us at ICANN. I'm so happy. These people are now very proud that they're part of this process. We have 21 people from outside of ICANN that are involved from different countries, from Burkina Faso, from uh, Mauritius, from faraway lands, from China and Russia. Right? Great, you know? And, and so they are now part of the process. It's also a great way to get management involved. Management loves to feel like they have something, right? So here, now they're part of this. Give them, maybe they, they have the combination to the safe. Wonderful. Works good. I know there's management in this room, and it's probably going to come back and bite me, but all right. <laughs> all right, be responsible. Uh, executive level involvement, that's what I said. It's a very good thing to have them involved in this, and uh, in, in some ways they must be. And uh, a, a combination to a safe, anybody can handle that. They won't screw that up. All right, security. Um, this also, I think, uh, I can thank Alex Smirnoff again. He said this too. Uh, machinery is easy, people are hard. So, so you, have, you have a checkpoint here because we both <laughs> agree. This is, this is the problem. All right. Security, yeah, breaks down in multiple things. Physical security, environmental, blah, 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 blah. Usual stuff, okay? Uh, all right. Got to move this along here. 
So these are standard things you get with your data center, so you really don't have to worry about them. But they will go in your, your do what you say document. Um, oh, oh, what's that? Um, so there's the concept of tiers. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. I know you all work in data centers, but there's a concept of tiers in security. And a tier is each successively difficult um, a place to get in. So we are probably a few tiers here. The front door of the hotel is tier one. That's tier two. So we have two tiers of security. If there's a safe, that's tier three. Okay. Um, each one of these walls doesn't have to be created, you know, ridiculously strong. But just for fun, I like showing this because I, f I learned how to make secure walls by getting a document that the NSA publishes. DCID 6. I have no idea how to build this when I was working at ICANN. All right, this is all new stuff for me. What do I do? Do I make the walls ridiculous? Do I get guys with guns? What do I do? Risk assessment? No, not getting the guys with guns. Anyway, it was funny to find this document on the net. It says, this is how you make what's called a SCIF, Secure Compartmental Information Facility. Standard U.S. government secure facility for discussing uh, top secret documents. Anyway, all it is is the same wall. I don't know if you call this wallboard. Wallboard with a little bit of stretched metal in the middle. This is like a cheap picnic table and uh, more wallboard. That's it. Because the goal here is not to stop the criminal, it's to detect the criminal. Very hard to cut a hole in that and go in and out. All right, same thing with safes. You could go crazy. These are top secret safes. I didn't know what to get, so I used to work in the government. I said, those look like pretty good safes. So that's what we use. <laughs> but, but it turns out, that a safe in a grocery store, a food store, is stronger than this safe, okay? Because these safes are, again, designed for detection. It takes 20 hours to go in and out of one of these safes undetected. Grocery store safe, you know, whatever. But this, to break into this, 15 minutes with a drill and you're in. Grocery store safe is much more than 15 minutes because if you're going in the grocery store to see steal money, do you care if you're detected? No, you just want to get the money and go, right? So, again, these may not be what you want. You may want a grocery store safe. They're much cheaper than these. So, anyway, <laughs> um, this is what a couple TLDs use. I, I cannot say which ones, but this is exactly what they use. This is from their data center. They take a hotel safe and they put this in the, in the rack. So the rack door is another tier. The door to the safe is another tier of security. Okay? This is perfectly fine. Tamper evident bags. Okay. All right. Sorry. All right. So this is one of the things I hope you all take away from this uh, at, at minimum. Right? Tamper evident bags, I'm going to talk while I do this. Tamper evident bags are one of the cheapest forms of security. Let's say that you're like most of us and you simply um, generate keys on a flash drive. You could put them in this tamper evident bag and you have just now created an another tier of security. These are actually very well made. I'm going to pass them around right now. So uh, while, while I'm doing this, I'm going to put them in here. I don't want to waste too much time here. I tend to talk too long. I apologize. But, but you can see I'm kind of excited about this stuff because you know, none, of this, none of this stuff I knew before. I learned all of this by the, you know, whatever, hundreds of thousands of dollars that, uh, you know, ICANN was paying to learn how to build a secure facility because we were tasked with signing the route. Um, so... These bags, these are cash bags. So I'm going to pass them around. If you break in, you can break out without detection. What's in it is yours. They're tags. They're RFID, they're um, locator tags. Okay. All right. So anyway, here's an, another example of one. This one is not that good. You notice I'm handing one with a different color. Uh, I tasked one of my students once to break in and break out without my detection. Little small, little short Muslim woman in, in Trinidad, Tobago. She comes in the next morning, she hands me this. With a, you know, face on it. La, la, la. She broke in. She was able to get in. So, nothing is perfect, but this still is, uh, I just wanted to show you that because that was really cute. Um, all right. Access control. 
the, the main thing to take away from this slide is no one person has full control. The system administrator can't come in and do everything themselves. And this is the first thing that my engineering friends always get angry at me about. Says, why, why don't you trust me? That's not the point. We have separate roles. We have, require at least two or three people to be able to get in and access things. This is how you build trust, okay? But very simple. Um, this all comes for free. Intrusion detectors, sensors, motion cameras, tamper evident bags. Ten cents each, okay? <laughs> I mean, just, just use them, all right? <laughs> you know, you, they, each one has a number, and you can write the number down. This, this gives you this chain of custody. Okay. We know this. Of course, you've got to have more than one. Backup. Logical, we know, good. pick good passwords, et cetera, et cetera, two-factor authentication. This no one person has full control. This is the, this is the key point here. Um, there's something called M of N where you have, say, you need any three of ten people. This way you can, like, if someone gets sick or someone gets hit by a car or something, there's a way to split this. For you programmers, you could actually tack that on with that file. Look for sssss.c. Um, but this is built into crypto equipment. And you, you could simply take the, take the code for the safe and split it between two people. One has the first half, one has the second half. I know somebody who does that. Trivial. Now you've added one more person to the mix. You don't have to, but I'm just saying. You know, there, there are ways to do this. Um, Boy, you guys know more about this than I do, probably. You know, crypto, you know, uh, you got to follow regulations. I, I know that, you know, <clears throat> you know with Snowden, show, showing a standard from a, a U.S. standards organization probably is not, you know, not the most useful thing here. <laughs> but, but, you know, so I, I'm always asked, you know, what, <clears throat> what, what's a good key length? And here's the recommendations, probably a little bit long and too uh, old at this point, for RSA keys. So, and, and there are other factors involved here, so this is, there's very little direct guidance. No one knows absolutely, can a 1024-bit key be broken in six months? That's the lowest number I've heard. That's why I'm saying that. 1024, six months. So if you're using 1024, change it in six months. But it's just based on anecdotal evidence and various stories, so. Okay. You got to follow local regulations. Ghost is, I know, a protocol, Russian protocol. Fine. You got to do whatever you have to do. Uh, we can skip this. There's some specifics in DNSSEC that require uh, um, that you can use to uh, make it harder for someone to see what you have. Okay, hardware. Um, okay, hardware. This is where people always end up spending too much time and too much money. Says, I want something with two keys. You know, like a like a missile silo, right? You can get stuff like that, but you really don't need stuff like that, right? But who are your stakeholders? Who are you selling this to? You know, we, we have iris scanners uh, and, and, and pretty interesting looking, you know, access control systems. If you ask me point blank, are they absolutely necessary? No, not really. S some of that, it, they work. There's not, they're not insecure, but some of that is a little bit of theater because our, stakehold, our stakeholders are everybody. So, so we need to, you know, do something. So who are your stakeholders? If, if your stakeholders are just your enterprise, you know, maybe you don't have to do this much. So, but you have to ask this question because crypto software can cost a lot. Good random number generator. I, I see that a number of pretty technical people here. So... We all know how important this is. We all know how many times this has been the weak point, the Achilles heel for a system. Uh, good common standards are always good, and of course, you got to be able to back up your keys. So, all right, here we go. So this is, you know, again, these are U.S. standards because there are very few other standards out there. FIPS level four, FIPS level three. These standards are about to be changed into some ISO standards. So, you know, that should make you and your organizations happy that you do not have to rely on a, uh, an, an American standard for these things. You can, you can, there'll be an international standard based on these things soon. Basically, level three, 
detects if someone has broken in to try to get your keys. These are devices. Okay? Level four, the keys self-destruct. No smoke, no fire, which is really unfortunate. Uh, I only got one back. Someone must have broken the other one. All right. Uh, anyway, so... Huh? <laughs> yeah, tampered? Oh, the tampered. So, so level four, it self-destructs, but <clears throat> there's no fire or anything, which is, you know, unfortunate. So it's not very interesting. Uh, but some, some countries, <clears throat> like Brazil, have their own uh, certifications. So uh, that's a common standard. You want to make sure the HSM follows PKCS11. Uh, here are your various options. Smart cards. This is what I've been recommending so many, so many people to use, smart cards. In DNSSEC, there are two keys. There's one key that is published and you have to exchange called the KSK. It, that, this is your root key for your particular zone. It's the base key. All right? That might be something you would put in a smart card. That's your HSM. $20. Fine. Big deal. All right? The Japanese do this. Okay? This is, this is perfectly good. And the uh, smart card HSM <coughs> is German. Feishin is uh, Chinese. Uh, Ventra is Finnish. Um, anyway, so they're you know, from different countries if you, you know, so desire. There are other things you can use as well. <coughs> you can have the smart cards in the form of a USB token as well. They're a little more. Okay. Random number generators. We've all heard the problems with random number generators. This is one of the best random number generators. But, you know, no one does this anymore. Uh, I forgot the gentleman's name, but someone just put a, back in the 80s or something, just put a camera pointing to this thing and, you know, it's random. It's really random. But you can go crazy. $10,000 will buy you <coughs> a quantum mechanical uh, laser random number generator. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's built into CPU chips, but I've heard there's, you know, some suspicions about that, so, you know, whatever. And there's some standards as well, if you, if you care to follow standards. Um, sometimes, you know, standards are necessary in order to convince your, your boss or your employer that you've done things correctly. So, um, so okay, so here's a, a FIPS level four. This is what we use for the root. Um, very sensitive, $20,000. If you hit it too hard, it resets, and it's $6,000 to repair. I've done it. I've done it a couple times. One time the air, airport people did it. What's this? It's a computer. Make it go on. I don't understand. Make it go through the machine. So if it goes to the machine, it goes bump, 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 bump. Comes out, it's broken. It's not very happy. Uh, <laughs> but there are other things. Level three, you'll see these boards. Um, this is what they use for .com. .com is 100 million domain names. Okay, so they're using that. Okay. Uh, oops. Oh, okay. Um, so this is, this is various implementations. Uh, we have that iris scanner for the root, uh, for, for ICANN, and you can, you know, it's like I said, it works, but not that different from a keypad de uh, device. Uh, and these are some others from .com. This is China. One of the things, one of the things hopefully you're noticing is people are sharing this. This used to be very secretive information how a certificate authority manages its keys. It's very, you know. Anyway, people are sharing this, and hopefully, you know, you will too. Now I'm just showing examples at the root. This is various tiers, the way we do it. Here's what it really looks like. People come in here, go in here, another tier, another tier, and then you see the safes in the middle. And the red circles are the different people that are in charge of each thing. I said one person has the safe code, one person has the pin code for the cards. One person has access to the room. All different people. Here's what we really do have at the root. Um, yep. We're very transparent. That's LAX right there. X marks the spot. We tell you exactly where we are. Go ahead. Shoot it. <laughs> uh, we have another facility on the East Coast. This is 25 miles outside of Washington, D.C. It's right outside the nuclear blast zone. That's not why we chose it. We chose it because there were various other really secure things there. So we thought, why not? We're in good company. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is the uh, first uh, root signing thing. I, I just need to show that. You have one of your, your very own here as one of the people that, that represents Russia in this, um, this exercise. Dima is right there. Um, so he regularly 
he's one of the dedicated ones, regularly helps us go through this process. We cannot perform this function without three of seven of, of these people for anything. So ICANN does not have the power by itself to do anything. So the only way I could perceive that, you know, this could be trusted globally. Uh, anyway, we have many others. There's Vince Cerf. Uh, this guy's name is Dan Kaminsky. He's the one that made this all happen. There was an awful lot of politics in trying to get this to happen. No one wanted um, to follow through or take the responsibility for generating a key at the root. But he, uh, Dan Kaminsky, uh, used the newspapers and made everyone very nervous. And uh, politicians hate newspapers. So anyway, he's very good, but he also uh, had a lot of uh, arguments against this, but embrace your enemies. Make them part, part of it. That makes a big difference. This works too. Small CCTLD, safe like that, safe deposit box for the backup, smart cards. So no expensive HSM, just smart cards. Works perfectly good. All right. Um, oh yeah, so this is Costa Rica and Argentina. This is what they do. Uh, literally... They uh, have a machine that is actually taking an unsigned zone and creating it a making a DNSSEC zone. They have a laptop uh, that is offline. They generate keys on one side, send the keys across to this offline machine, all right? And then they sign that with the keys on that offline machine. They send them back, they drop them in, and they publish. That works, okay? This works too. No smart cards, just flash drive, <laughs> all right? Offline system, online system. Czech Republic does something like this. Learn from other people's mistake. Almost, almost done here. Yep, almost done. Um, one of the biggest problems if you're an ISP, and this might kill it for any of you deploying DNS, ISPs thinking deploying DNSSEC, if a website goes down, or let, let, no, let's back up. You have a customer, and let's say they try to go to a certain domain name or website, and they can't get to the website because the website has deployed DNSSEC improperly. So it's not the ISP's fault. It's the website. But the ISP actually does the validation, checks the, KS, checks the keys, the KSK and the ZSK, checks the keys involved in this process. So the phone, whose phone rings? The ISP's phone rings, right? Because the customer doesn't know about DNSSEC. He doesn't care, right? He just can't get to this. Anyway, to cut to the chase, the worst case here was in the U.S. a couple years ago, NASA, our space agency, it's a government agency. Okay, so the government keeps, they kept screwing up deploying DNSSEC. They, they, they could not get this right, okay? Even, even .mil, which is managed by the CIA, okay? They screwed that up. Anyway, whatever. So they, they, they let it expire. So then everyone in the press thought it's a conspiracy between this ISP and NASA. The ISP is trying to block NASA, right? No, 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 no. They just, they just screwed up, all right? Anyway, so this is something to, to, to note. Remember, if you're an ISP, there are solutions, something called a negative trust anchor, which can temporarily say, do not check the DNSSEC for this. Yeah. Uh, that says I'm, I'm very close to done here. Uh, all right, so uh, signing operations, learn from experience, vacations, 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 vacations. Dot UK, their biggest problem early on was that um, one of their signatures, one of their systems started to fail on a Friday afternoon. The engineers look at their, their watch, go, well, you know, it's 5 o'clock. I'll do this on Monday. I'll fix it on Monday. Well, <clears throat> that engineer no longer works there. <laughs> but, but, but the thing was, you have to look at what, what is the longest time that you could have something valid. The NSSEC has what are called digital signatures that have time limits on them, right? How long should this time limit be? If you make it infinitely long, that means it gives an attacker infinite time to try to break the signature. If you make it too short, the guy might go off on the weekend on vacation or, or, or something. So what, what I am seeing is that the average time for signatures is one to two weeks, which is about the length of the vacation time for someone in the U.S. This is, these are lessons learned. Monitor the, because time matters, dot FR. France had problems with 
their signature is ex expiring. So this, this was one of the issues they had. So uh, you need somebody to monitor your, your signature. Very easy to do. You could write this in a little script. You could have someone else do this monitoring for you and look at your zone. Very important. That's the second thing we learned. Third thing we learned, mistakes are going to happen. This is the advantage that we're so early in the DNS sec deployment. It's okay to make some mistakes, but be public about this. If, you, if, if the instinct is to hide, people don't know what else you're hiding. This is a standard business case, actually. Uh, there was a company called uh, Johnson & Johnson in the US that, anyway, this was a great business uh, MBA case study because if you're honest about it, sure, you'll take a hit, but then people will trust you in the long run. .fr did this, .uk did this, so did everyone else. Everyone has been very direct about, yes, we screwed up, and here's what we're doing about it. Um, just some formal recommendations if you want. You, these slides will be downloadable. This is from our, our friendly Swedes. Um, okay, that doesn't have to be expensive. Basic things they must, all must have. Setting expectations, document procedures, good random number generator. There's a demo. Let's skip all these. Here's an example of something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, oh no, this is a, this is a long, this, this goes through the whole process of a DNS tech lookup. Again, if you want to take the slide, take it and you'll, you'll lose less hair. Um, so things can be very simple. If you actually were going to write this script, they can be really simple. I said time matters and you need to keep things signed. Very simple. You could just simply write, you could write a script like this that said, if I only have five more days before signature expires, update the signature. Okay? Done. <laughs> if you want to change keys, it's just as easy. Generate a new key, publish it for a while so people can see it. Once everyone's seen it, start using the new key instead of the old key to sign with things. Wait till everyone sees it. Get rid of the old key. That's all that does. All right. So, I think, yeah, I think that's it. So, Alex, Alexandra is now going to cover, for the first time, what, what after the root was signed, we're going to change the key. So I'm going to let her talk about that, because uh, it's, it's for us a very big deal, and we're very nervous about it, and we want you to know about it, full transparency. But before she does that, any questions? Nope. I would like to ask the following. Whatever you are talking about, there is a human factor. And I want to know the following. Is it possible to write those algorithms when some DNS system is reformed? That is a system that will automatically create, generate certain keys. I look at what you are saying, but this system is, DNSSEC is vulnerable. Still, it's vulnerable, what would you tell about this? System, it, you're right, the system is vulnerable, done this way. This is why you have a key ceremony. The trust is built in the key ceremony. So if you wanted to not use the algorithms, you could have every key generated in front of witnesses in a key ceremony and then use that key. Because you could trust that key because that key is generated publicly, uh, visibly. The algorithm I showed up there was one for something called the ZSK, the secondary key for a signing system. It is true that that can be compromised, but since it's the secondary key, it can also be replaced very easily. The primary key, the KSK, that is something that you would want generated in a very witnessed um, public key ceremony so that every step can be monitored and audited. Does that make sense to you? So, 
I don't know the idea of the keys. So it shows it can be publicly checked. The NSEC in the given case. It's the successive step in the approach to increase the level of trust, whatever is happening in the Internet. Consequently, the publicity in the described procedures increases the trust. When you are listening to this presentation, and if your government says that Americans are doing something with the Internet and so on and so forth, no. These procedures are open, and we, as citizens, can check it, and you, the official people, you are lying to us, to, to put it roughly. Accordingly, these step, the same procedures are done, summoned Radomer AM in, on the global level. They do procedures. Mr. Lamb is managing them. You in your country, there are people that you can get in touch with the same way you can learn from them. The global trust is set up in the following the, Whatever they are doing here, someone is repeating it here is in Armenia, US use, internet users can trust whatever you get. Do you think that uh, we should sign every zone uh, on the internet or only zone for level 3, level 4 or uh, what is the uh, d d deep? Well, I, I, well yeah, how, how deep? I think it depends on the application. I very much believe in need. If there's no need, as much as I can, one of ICANN's goal is to deploy DNSSEC, if there's no need, no. So I, I, th so I, think, I think at least to the second level, it would be very useful to have DNSSEC. But I envision many applications, as I pointed out in the beginning, um, that are purely um, machine to machine. So very specific applications where one IoT device, Internet of Things device, talks to another Internet of Things device. That could be many levels deep, right? Then DNSSEC becomes valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, no, do it. I do it in English. Uh, but Thank you. Talking about the needs, one of the... Uh, great advantages of having your sauna signed is that you actually can use it in applications. And one good example is that enables other security technology mm -hmm. to work. And uh, a good example is Dane, the, the I always get this thing. It's so successful that actually the Dutch government now actually requires this uh, for securing email and other stuff as well. They just put it out last week. They don't require it, but if you don't want to use it, you have to tell why you don't want to use it. That's the rule in how these things are. But that's, that's one of the good things of DNSSEC is that enables these type of technology. In Germany, the same thing is happening as well. So that's a good reason to do that. Thank you, thank you, Yap. He's, Yap is very right, and that's, that, as I was trying to point out in the beginning, was why I'm so excited about this. This is a chance for us to have true end-to-end -end security from anyone to anyone, and that is a, the holy grail for me. A um, good deal of misunderstanding of the NSSEC is that, that we do not till the end understand the practical application of this stuff and the practical application of these technologies. Why do we all need this? Richard described in a very nice manner the trust system. Richard gave the basics that we can really relearn on, and that Richard has really described the technology, the technology with the help of which the NSSEC is formed. Now, in the mindset of the people, there should be a question, why do we need this? I'd say, well, there are some things that must be applied up to email. The question is, on which level do we have to apply this? And how low do we have to go? Because seemingly we use closed channels on the network level, and we understand why is it necessary. And this is also end-to-end. -end. DNS is a 
special door, a special entry into the future of internet. We underestimate all these technologies, guys. And whatever we can settle with the help of the NSN, we can always settle this on the level of certain network stuff. Uh, quickly, one thing to remind the whole room is actually the, the not to forget the power of the, the community because you mentioned vendor lock-in, which is a very yeah. true case. At RIPNCC, we had an issue with Secure64 for resigning our key. So we brought that and they said we don't support that feature, which we thought should, should be part of any DNSSEC signup. So we took that to the RIP uh, DNS working group. A lot of operators said the same and we sent a video to the uh, vendor and said, hey, there is a big group of people, all of them DNS operators, your main customers, and they all say, uh, think you have to do this and you're doing wrong. And they, in few months, we had a patch, we have full support. So power of the community is here. We are a powerful community. Please keep doing that. Um, another thing is actually it's good investment to start uh, if, if uh, uh, DNS operators want to have uh, their own zone signed. And nowadays with RPKI, we basically have very similar models. So if you invest in, uh, in a system to have your keys stored and everything, please, you can, you can also use that for to, to run similar. RPKI properly yeah. uh, for, for your number resources. But in fact, also, if I may, once you've developed the RPKI, the DNS SAC thing, you can also become your own certificate authority. You're almost there. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I, th I think it's good investment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, one project in the HSMs uh, which uh, I, I think is good to mention is Cryptech, uh, mm, yes. which uh, yeah, very open, uh, an, uh, an attempt to get to a very open and transparent uh, hardware HSM. So if you're interested, please uh, look it up. Uh, and again, if I may add to that, that Cryptech experiment is very good because the HSMs now, the really high-end ones, are made in the US and in the UK. And in <laughs> so you might want to make one but yourself so yes. that you actually yeah. Uh, know what's in it. Yeah, so but, but Cryptic is completely, their, their aim is yeah. to be completely open, completely yeah. uh, testable and, and all this. That's stuff. good. Yeah. I'm part so of that look one. it up if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, final thing, the lava ranting was by Silicon Graphics, a uh, guy called uh, London. Uh, ah, London yeah, Court, it is, no. it is. Thank you for, <laughs> yeah, that was exactly. So, so, so thank you, thank you very much. Those are really good points. Um, so now that I've convinced you how important this is and that the root has this key, that's about to change. I and think. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much.